Hello, everyone, and welcome to the IAB 2018 Mobile Webinar Series. Today, we'll be discussing the power of in-app advertising. My name is Amanda Baldwin. I'm the manager of the IAB Mobile Marketing Center of Excellence, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. I'm really excited about the thought leaders who will be presenting today, and I'll be introducing them to you one by one before their respective segments. I just have a couple of notes on logistics before we get started. First is that we encourage everyone to ask questions. You can ask a question by writing to us through the moderator chat. You can find this on the menu on the right side of your screen. Uh, the icon looks like the shadow of a person. Uh, send all your questions through there. We've reserved plenty of time at the end of, for Q&A, but please feel free to send your questions as we go. Also, we're often asked if we're recording the webinar, and we just want to let you know up front that we are, and that after we're finished here today, you'll receive a follow-up email with the recording. Next is the agenda. I'm going to give a short introduction on the in-app advertising space. Then we'll hear a presentation from Pubmatic on the state of in-app advertising. After them, IBM Watson Advertising will be presenting on understanding the in-app ecosystem. And then we're going to end our presentations with a conversation from Startup and Rovio. And they're going to focus on the balance between smart targeting, user experience, and privacy, the post-GDPR era. And then as I mentioned, we're going to end with Q&A. Now back to our topic for today, in-app advertising. IAB and IAB Tech Lab are working really closely with our members to address many of the issues which I will outline in a moment. Compared to mobile browser ad experience, in-app advertising can pose some challenges such as requiring new infrastructure such as SDKs, there are some risks with in-app ad fraud, and there can be challenges with attribution. But apps are an important part of the mobile ecosystem. Users are spending way more time in-app compared to mobile browsers. And according to IAB's Digital Trends Consumer Usage Report, adults in the United States are spending upwards of 88% of their smartphone internet usage in app. Now, before we dive into the presentations, we're going to take a quick look at how our industry has progressed in in app advertising in recent years. In July of 2017, the IAB Tech Lab released MRAID 3.0, which offers updates that improve in-app ad execution. Now, these improved guidelines allow for the creation of interactive in-app ads to be more time and cost efficient. It also enables the ad to measure things such as viewability, audibility, location data, and other features to present users with the best possible experience. This update is also a reflection of the industry's commitment to put user experience front and center. And as we know, when the user is put first, uh, that will allow for much higher engagement. Next is this past April, IAB Tech Lab released the Open Measurement Software Development Kit. And this eliminates the need for multiple SDKs for third-party viewability and verification measurement for in-app advertising. Now, this is a game changer for the industry since apps can have upwards of 15 to 20 SDKs. You should really consider implementing these specifications if you have not done so already. So in the follow-up email, I'll be sure to uh, provide links to these documents so you can take a closer look. And lastly, I just want to mention that in 2019, you can expect to see more app-focused initiatives coming out of the IAB Mobile Center of Excellence. We're going to focus on topics such as viewability, fraud, identity, and we're also working closely with the IAB Tech Lab on an ads.txt type solution for the mobile web. So today we're going to deep dive into the state of in-app advertising and share with you how you can leverage it to drive growth for your team. And as I mentioned, there's Q&A at the end, so please provide questions anytime during the webinar please send them through the moderator chat. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Mike Chawla, who's the Director of Product Management of Header Bidding at Pubmatic. Thank you, Amanda. Next slide, please. 
So I'm going to be talking to you today about the state of in-app advertising. Um, next slide, please. And to kind of run, to run through that, first I'll talk about kind of an overview of where the market is, look at three key trends that we're seeing in the market, and to drivers of present growth. And then finally, look at what we think the drivers of future growth in 2019 and beyond will be for in-app advertising. Next slide, please. So in-app advertising is seeing really robust growth. And the core reason behind that is it's because it's where the consumers are. And I think intuitively, we all know this because we're all spending a lot of time on our phones, we see everywhere we go, we see people staring at their phones. I know for myself personally, whereas like a couple of years ago, if I was sitting in front of a computer and needed to look something up, I would often just, um, I'd, often, I'd always use my laptop. But these days, like so many mobile apps are so good and so efficient that even when I'm in front of my computer, I'm often reaching for my phone and using an app to find the information I need. And so this is, this, is translating into really robust growth of time spent in apps. So 11% so year over year growth. And when you start compounding that, that really becomes a big number. And the other piece of this that's important is that app piece. Whereas a few years ago, many users were spending more time in the web browser on their device. Now we're seeing 85% of time spent with their mobile devices is spent in app. And we've looked at numbers kind of across different markets, and these all range from 80 to 90 percent. So this globally, people are spending their time on their devices in apps. And what and what that means for in-app advertising is where the consumers are, where the audience is. So not surprisingly, the ad spend is fall is following to where those consumers are. And so we've seen a 27% increase in mobile ad spend in 2018, which is really robust growth. And it's not just volume of spend that's going up. There's also, there's also increased CPMs for in apps. And then we've got this 11% number year over year increase, which is also a really good number and shows how, how the market is progressing. Next slide, please. So now I'd like to start talk about some key trends that have been driving this growth. And one of those key trends is mobile video. And some of the numbers I'm going to give you from these key trends are from the Pubmatic QMI or quarterly mobile index. So every quarter Pubmatic analyzes the 12 trillion transactions that go across our platform monthly, in addition to looking at overall industry trends and issues this QMI report. Um, and so these numbers are from the Q3 2018 QMI, which is going to be coming out next week, but here we're getting a bit of a preview. So this first key trend is around video. And so based on impression volume, video is really shifting from desktop to mobile. And these numbers in the graph are kind of astounding to me that a year ago, three quarters of the impressions on the probiotic platform were on desktop. And now mobile is over half of them. And it's the fastest growing type of video out there. And it's the primary driver of all video revenue. So when marketers want to reach consumers with video advertisements, they're going, they're, they're, they're reaching them on mobile. Next slide, please. So not only is, is video, is, video really driving growth on mobile, it's specifically driving growth in app. Just like we saw before on that overview that 85% of the time consumers are spending on their devices in an app, not surprisingly, that means they're, view they're viewing video in app. And this is a really astounding change where we see a 300, almost 300% year over year change increase in app impressions. Uh, and so you can see, you can see from these numbers that a year ago, the majority was on the web and now, now it's an app. So it's a really large shift. And this is part of what is behind these driving courses that in, um, increasing spend and CPM in the in-app market. Next slide, please. 
So for the third trend, we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about um, header bidding in app. Now, header bidding has basically taken over the desktop world and really the web world because of its way it increases yield for publishers. Like web inventory, header bidding has become the default way that it that it is monetized and gets to advertising exchanges. And so overall, Pubmatic saw an 18% year-over-year increase in header bidding um, impressions. But again, the majority of this increase is actually coming from mobile, 95% year-over-year increase in header bidding volume. And we're seeing about 14% of the imp mobile impressions we monetize are coming via in-app header bidding. And uh, I want to take a moment and talk about what we mean, because sometimes like purists will say, well, there is no header on a mobile page. Like the term header bidding comes from putting it in the web page header. But what I really mean here when I say header bidding for in-app is a is requesting all demand partners simultaneously and considering their considering their bids instead of the traditional waterfall that we've seen in mobile and we used to see on the web where where um, ad networks are requested one by one. And, and like, we're really expecting header bidding volume to grow in app. Um, Imobi did a study this year where they said that, where, the, where they found that 31% of US publishers who hadn't adopted header bidding had stayed on the sidelines because they had a limited understanding of the technology. But I think as the solution, vendor solutions in the market for header bidding improve, um, and we, and and the industry sees the benefit, then we're gonna we're gonna see an increase in header bidding. Next slide, please. So this has been a good look at what's been driving growth so far. So what 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 do we see driving growth right now? And there's two areas I want to call out. One is PMPs or private marketplaces. And I think there are kind of there are generic reasons why PMPs are driving um driving growth in, in app. And there's also um, like mobile specific reasons. You know, for the generic reasons, PMPs provide a host of benefits, the same ones that they provide for web inventory. They allow publishers and buyers to transact directly, um, you know, ha ha buyers to feel like they know, they have good assurance that the inventory is what it says it is, that it isn't spoofed. They, can increase fee transparency. They give options for publishers to give buyers volume discounts. Um, and on mobile, this has translated into 85% year-over-year growth on Pobanic platform for PMP, for in-app. Um, but when we get to the mobile-specific reasons, I, I think you know this, tra this transparency and assurance about the inventory is even more important on mobile than it is on the web. Um, buyers have had concerns about is their inventory they're getting from, you know, is inventory they're buying really what it says it is? Is it legitimate? And PMPs go a long way to solve that problem. And I think the other piece of this is that the we talk a lot about how video is growing rapidly in app. And regardless of where video is, it, it has a much higher share of being transacted by PMPs for those quality transparency and the assurance reasons. And so that's really driving this growth on mobile. So the second driver is back to in-app header bidding. And in-app header bidding is doing a couple, couple of really important things. Instead of the traditional waterfall, it's bringing all the demand in at once. And we know from experience on the web that when you, when you bring more demand to compete for a given impression, this improves publisher yield. It's got additional benefits around, it's more transparent about what the auction dynamics are, and it makes it much easier for, for in-app publishers to manage their, their partners. Um, with, um, next slide, please. So when we look to the future, um, there's three trends I wanna talk about I think are gonna drive growth in 2019 and beyond. And the first of these trends is is growth of header bidding. And there's a few reasons for that. If you think about what it takes today in the kind of traditional SDK-based waterfall approach to add a demand partner, a, um, a in-app publisher has to first get their developers to incorporate the SDK. 
and I've been building software for a long time. And I, like one of the things I just know about is you never have as many development resources as you want. And so that takes a while to, you know, prioritize that, get it in your, get it in your sprint, get it done. But then, you know, you've got to issue a new release of the app, you upload it to the app store and you wait for users to download that new version. So this is a really long cycle versus with in-app header bidding, because the in-app header bidding is typically server to server, you're able to manage your demand partners from the cloud and you can add additional demand partners without require, without incorporating that SDK. And so that that's a big benefit in terms of speed. There's other downsides to SDKs. They increase code size, they create stability risks in app. If the SDK crashes, then the app crashes along with it, creating a poor user experience. There's risks around data for the publisher because they don't really know what the um, SDK is collecting and that can create compliance risks in markets where there are strong regulations on user privacy. So all like, so these reasons are all driving, um, driving, in-app header bidding. And the Imobi study I was talking about earlier said that 52% of publishers are planning to use in-app header bidding in the next 12 months. And this kind of leads us into the second piece here, is that as the market shifts to header bidding, it changes the how in-app monetization works because it goes from this waterfall world where um, ad networks were given priority based on historical prices to um, to having all the demand compete and which raises, which will raise publisher yield, make each impression more competitive. And so that's shifting the dynamic, shifting the dynamics and making sure publishers get full value for their impression. The final area I want to talk about here is about um, inventory quality. So uh, on mobile in app, there have been concerns again about authenticity of inventory and are buyers getting what they think they're getting? And so kind of the first development here is that the vendor tools for anti-fraud are improving as an app is growing. It's become an area of focus for more and more vendors who provide um, anti-fraud tools and just general inventory quality tools. But there's two other pieces that I think are important here. Um, Amanda mentioned both, both of them at, in the intro. The, the, that first additional piece is the mobile ads.txt. Um, the IAB just released that a draft specification for public comment. And just as on the web, that's going to give buyers greater assurance they're transacting on inventory that is what it says it is. They're buying it from someone who is authorized to sell it. And the second one I want to call out here is open measurement. And as Amanda said, that um, IAB released this open measurement SDK back in April. And, you know, with anything new, it takes a little while to get industry adoption, but we're really seeing a strong push in the industry towards adopting open measurement. And we think that's going to be really important, particularly for bringing brand dollars into in-app inventory. Because one of the things that we're hearing pretty consistently from the buy side is that a lot of their buyers insist on having third-party neutral viewability numbers. And those have been hard to get in an app. It's been kind of spotty coverage, and those buyers typically use one of the play one of the players. And if that player is not is not SK is not on that particular app, and they can't get viewability numbers. And this is holding money on the sidelines. And so, as open measurement gets adopted, that's going to help bring in more money into in-app because buyers can get those viewability numbers that they expect. And frankly, a lot of them are requiring now before they'll put their dollars behind that platform. So with these trends, I'm really looking forward to seeing where this goes in 2019. Um, we're expecting that mobile in-app spend growth and CPM growth to continue to be robust. Next slide, please. So thank you all for listening. If you have questions, please put them in the moderator's chat so we can address them at the end. Yes, and thank you so much, Mike. And as you mentioned, everybody, please uh, send some questions through to the moderator chat. You can direct them at Mike, and we will answer them at the end. So now we're going to move on to the next presentation. We have Jeremy Lavasek, who is the Head of Revenue at IBM Watson. 
So take it away, Jeremy. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, hi, everyone. Hope you're having a good day. Um, if we could just go to the next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so I'm Jeremy Lavasek. I'm the head of revenue at IBM's Watson Advertising. Uh, just for those who may not know us, uh, IBM Watson Advertising is the combined assets of the weather company, a uh, large publisher known for weather.com and our large mobile app, uh, combined with IBM Watson. So this uh, transaction took place about two and a half years ago when IBM acquired the, the weather company, uh, and we created Watson Advertising a little over a year ago. Um, and today our business consists of media uh, and publishing, uh, a data business, and also a technology business. Uh, but I'm here today to tell you about uh, our experience in the in-app ecosystem. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Uh, whenever we talk about in-app, we always just like to level set with um, how quickly this has happened. Um, it, it may seem like we've been, you know, in the app ecosystem for a long time, but really if you look back, uh, you know, the first iPhone was only introduced 10 years ago. Uh, major apps like the Weather Company's app or a, a Facebook or a Twitter or, or any of these large apps um, are really only a few years, uh, you know, below that. Um, so this ecosystem is still very new. It's grown incredibly quickly. Um, and of course, just anecdotally, um, I can still think back to, you know, commuting uh, and seeing folks uh, maybe using a laptop or, or doing something else on a train ride. Uh, now it's, it's universal. 100% of people use phones all the time. Um, and just to back that up with a few statistics, uh, According to a re recent eMarketer report, people spend an average of three hours and 35 minutes per day on a mobile device, uh, which is a large portion of their day. This group probably over-indexes on that number. Um, and apps will now account for over 90% of Internet time um, and smart on smartphones um, and 77% of Internet time on tablets. So people are using their phones uh, every day, and when they are using their phones, uh, they're using apps. So this is a... The takeaway here is that this is a really, really fast-growing market that has just emerged in the last decade, um, and it has become dominant. It is the absolutely dominant way that, that people consume digital media and content um, are through their phones and primarily through apps. So if you go to the next slide. So how to be successful in this market from an advertising point of view? Um, and this is comes from... Uh, some of the best practices that we've developed uh, in terms of creating successful ad campaigns within our, our app footprint, uh, but really we're borrowing from uh, a variety of practices that we've seen across the industry. So there's three areas that we think are driving the success of in-app advertising. Uh, one are native integrations and the use of, uh, you know, units that are more native and more custom uh, that fit into experiences more cleanly. Uh, second is the use of data. Uh, there are a number of different data sets that are available in the app ecosystem. Uh, I think many folks in the digital advertising industry are very comfortable with data, uh, but it's important to recognize how the, the data sets that you use in app uh, are different than what might be used on desktop. And then finally, innovation. Uh, as we said, this market has grown very quickly, um, and it's continuing to evolve very quickly. So. You know, the apps that were the top apps of five years ago um, have definitely been replaced, and we will continue to see uh, new developments in terms of formats, content, styles, uh, functionality. Um, so it's important to stay on top of innovation in this space. You could go to the next slide. So if we dive into native integrations, uh, you can see an example on the, on the right-hand side of the slide here from, uh, from our new app that we've recently launched. It's really about getting into an organic experience. Um, I think then when many apps first launched, um, you know, a lot of standard IAB units were used, and that's still the case uh, in many places, but uh, marketers and publishers and media owners have come to realize that the app experience is unique. Um, and having an ad unit that can integrate more cleanly into that content or align with that content is likely to be more successful. Um, it prevents interruption. Uh, I think that there's been many periods in kind of the development of the app ecosystem where there have been heavy use of units like interstitials, um, and those can make sense um, in a lot of, in some use cases. 
Uh, but for many content-based apps, uh, providing something that's more integrated and, and doesn't interrupt the user experience um, tends to perform better for the advertiser and also tends to um, uh, perform better for the publisher in terms of uh, making sure that an audience isn't, isn't put in threat. Um, and of course, better and longer viewability. So the app ecosystem is very fast moving. Uh, many apps have a sort of scroll style design uh, where users can be flipping through content very quickly. Uh, so using a native experience can often uh, create better viewability, better uh, impact, better engagement. Um, and that's really something that we've taken to heart with our, uh, our Weather Channel products. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, data. Uh, this is a critical part of the business, certainly for us, um, but it's important to think about how data um, is different on the mobile side. And certainly as we've become part of IBM, data has only become more important to what we do uh, because we know that, you know, tools like AI and Watson, for example, are, are dependent on great data sets. So we know that uh, whatever tools you're using in the market, data is only going to become more important for you um, over time. So some of the unique things about mobile are the ability to target individual needs, provide relevant information. Um, and the big difference in my mind is that how those things tie to location data. Uh, this has obviously been a large trend in the marketplace, but I'm personally of the opinion that uh, there's still a great deal of work to be done um, to fully leverage the power of location data and do it in a responsible way. Uh, certainly things like uh, GDPR can't be, uh, you know, underestimated in the space, uh, but making sure that we're, you know, providing value to consumers, making sure we're being transparent about how data is used, um, and then ultimately giving them a great experience, um, the ability to kind of really leverage location data and collect location data um, is very unique in app, um, and it's different than other platforms like, like desktop. So, we know that users want more relevant, kind of individually based uh, information. Uh, An app really has the richest data sets uh, compared to some of the other channels that we, that we see out there, whether that be video or desktop. So using location, using um, ad IDs and, and all the, the kind of audience based data that comes with an app, um, and then even using event based data. The thing to remember about app usage is that when that app is being used, it is probably being used, it's more so than a desktop, it is being used out in the real world. Uh, so in our case, things like weather can become important, uh, but also a number of other kind of real world signals um, matter a lot more than just uh, the audience targeting. It could be things like traffic, it could be things like, um, uh, you know, people that are around you, kind of social signals. Uh, so there's a great deal of data that's available uh, to marketers and publishers um, in the app ecosystem, and really leveraging that brings the power of the platform um, to both the users and the marketers. If we go to the next slide. And it's important to also focus on innovation. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, if we think about apps that we used heavily just five years ago versus the apps that are used heavily today, um, we've seen a great shift in ad formats and creative um, and how those are used in, uh, in the consumer experience. So uh, certainly dynamic creative is a large trend that um, we are leaning into and I think all many marketers are leaning into. Um, apps have become very visually driven. Um, a lot of the, the functionality of phones is based on photographs. Um, and that leads to a great deal of uh, photo apps, uh, certainly things like Instagram come to mind. Uh, but there are a number of apps out there that all use very, very strong kind of photo and sharing functionality. Um, and if you think about that experience within, you know, the use of your phone, uh, really what that means is sort of a full screen takeover uh, from an experience point of view. Anytime you use a photo functionality on an iOS phone or an Android phone or whatever phone you may have, um, it basically takes over the full screen. So as users become kind of conditioned and, and used to that experience, uh, I think they've come to expect the same from their apps. Um, so we're certainly experimenting with this within our apps, um, but there's a large kind of trend in the market for more of these kind of full screen takeover experiences for both content and advertising. Um, 
And this is really, I think, a, an important trend if you think about uh, the next five years uh, in the app ecosystem. I think you're going to see more and more usage of the inf entire uh, brain by both content owners and, and marketers. So if you go to the next slide. Um, and I want to talk quickly just about a, a short case study that we did with, uh, with Hulu. Uh, and the reason I bring it up is that it, it weaves together many of the points that we, we call out as best practices in this presentation. Uh, so Hulu worked with us to um, create a new experience to connect with their subscribers uh, using our Watson Ads product. So the Watson Ads product is, again, a, a product that we built uh, in combining both the weather company assets um, and IBM assets. So just some quick stats on the campaign to, to start. Um, the goal of the campaign was to build awareness for the overall brand uh, of Hulu, uh, their launch with live TV, educate their users on services, uh, and differentiate their brand as a preferred streaming service over the competition. So when we put this campaign together, um, we delivered uh, a number of great results for Hulu, and you can see some of them here in the slide. Uh, 44 million total impressions served, 18,000 active user sessions, uh, and 3.5 conversations. Uh, so the way I summarize that data point is that uh, it's not just about the impressions served, but there was a great deal of engagement uh, with those ad units. Uh, when you see that level of active user, user session and then conversation, um, that indicates that the consumer is, is highly engaged in the ad experience. Uh, there were also a number of clicks um, through to both uh, within the buttons of the app and to to Hulu.com. So that's a very imp important performance metric. Uh, that tells us that consumers are actually getting information um, and seeking information with the ad unit. So the message is, is resonating, um, and they're using that to, uh, to actually get what they need out of the experience. Um, and then ultimately, there was more time spent on this unit. So uh, really what we're saying here is that this is an example of, a, of kind of the innovation bucket uh, in terms of creating a, an experience for consumers where uh, you're really engaging them. You can see on the right that we did uh, sort of a full screen takeover within the Watson ads experience. So uh, really allowing the consumers to engage with Watson um, and get their questions answered. Um, and then ultimately uh, find what they need from the Hulu brand, whether that's a, a recommendation about a, um, a piece of programming or how uh, one of their packages work, uh, but really making sure that consumers are getting what they need out of the experience um, through a very unique and innovative ad experience. Um, I'll also add that there is a heavy use of data in this campaign. Uh, we use location data and weather data to target this ad, uh, towards consumers that might be, you know, certainly are in locations where there's, you know, heavy usage of Hulu, um, and then weather conditions that lend itself to uh, more binge watching, right? So the, the easy example here that we frequently talk about is, um, is it a, a cold or rainy night? Uh, and maybe you want to stay home and, and actually binge watch some programming um, as opposed to going out to a movie theater or some other sort of entertainment-based activity. Um, but using data and this innovative format um, ultimately drove um, a ton of success for Hulu, um, and really the success for this in this case was measured by the engagement with the ad um, in the sense that users were having conversations, they were getting valuable pieces of information, um, and they were able to uh, use Hulu's products more successfully. Um, there's a number of other stats here on the bottom of the slide. I, I'll won't go through those now, but you can see that, again, much higher performance in terms of activation, conversion, um, and active user sessions in-app. So uh, I think the reason we show this example is that, you know, when combining these pieces together, um, data, innovation, um, and some of the native style integrations uh, really can lead to great success for, for advertisers and marketers. Um, and we think it's important that publishers and media owners be aware of that. Um, as they develop their solutions for the marketplace. Um, that's all I had for today, if you go to the next slide. Um, so thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Great, and thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, it seemed a huge theme of your entire presentation, from native to data to innovation. It really is focusing on the user experience. 
uh, and customizing it for them uh, so that they'll engage with it. So um, that's a great point uh, for our audience to just always remember to keep in mind. Um, great, and so if anybody has questions for Jeremy, please send them through to us using the moderator chat, and we will get to those at the end. And now for our last segment before Q&A, um, I'd like to introduce you to Yarko Rayamaki and Amri Barnes. Uh, they are going to discuss privacy uh, and data. So uh, Amri and Yarko, uh, go, take, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. I'd like to thank uh, you and the IAB team for inviting us to join the webinar. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to share startups perspective. I invited Yako to join me. So thank you, Yako, for joining us to this conversation, kind of to, to hear your perspective and Rovio's perspective. And let's start with, with a short introduction. Uh, Yako, please go ahead and introduce Rovio and, and your role at Rovio. Yeah, th thanks, thanks for for IAB and and also for for startup for having having us all also in in this webinar and and we we at Rovio we are of course one of the largest largest kind of game publishers on the mobile side and and we have been been spearheading also the in app in app monetization side on mo mobile for for a long time and I I can only I agree with with Jeremy that that of course it's always important to make sure that the the user experience in the app also related to the advertising is is great because then when when the users are happy and they're happy with consuming advertising then they of course are also relating more positively with the with the ads in the in inside the application as well. Thank you, Yarko. Let's move to the next slide. I start with a short introduction of myself. So my name is Omri Barnes and I'm VP Corporate Marketing and Strategic Partnerships at Startup. Can we move to the next slide, please, Amanda? So uh, briefly about Startup. So we are a mobile media and data company. Uh, Amanda talked briefly at the opening statement about the fact that company uh, needs to integrate SDK. So we just crossed a, a meaningful milestone, getting more than 500,000 apps to integrate our SDK recently. Uh, so we are a big player in the in-app advertising and mobile monetization, working with many different uh, advertisers and, and publishers. What we're going to talk, talk about today, at least from our perspective, is about the data signals. And Jeremy, Jeremy mentioned the, the importance of data in the in-app advertising. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the privacy regulation roadmap. And last, we're going to have a kind of an open conversation about the balance between those two. So uh, let's move to the next slide, please, please, and let's talk about data signals for a second. I think that today we are at the verge of the end of 2018. We can see other unprecedented number of data signals that are being collected by different platforms. So obviously, it depends on the nature of the company and the breadth of the technology. But this is a fairly good sample of the ability of many players out there, uh, at least to some extent, to kind of have deep understanding of the mobile user. And in that sense, we are no longer in a world that we are targeting the right user, we are targeting the right context. So uh, I, we are not looking at the user from a demographic standpoint or specific location. It's mainly about the context of the usage. Am I commuting now on the train, as Jeremy mentioned in his opening, or am I maybe at the airport now and killing some time? The nature of the usage is crucial to come up with the right value proposition. And by utilizing those uh, data signals, we can come up with a kind of a, a, a new level of targeting and user understanding. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of concerns uh, all over the world, I would say, about pr privacy in light of the ability to have such a deep understanding on, on the user kind of on a personal level. And this is even without any personal information, even without any PII being collected. Uh, let's move 
to the next slide. If we are looking at the roadmap of regulation, so uh, I guess the, all of us already aware that the GDPR is live and effective as of May 2018. Uh, and the majority of the players in the industry uh, were well aware of the GDPR and kind of ready uh, to this going live. But looking at ahead, we know that there is a, a bill that is going to be effective in California, which is a big part of the U.S. economy as of January 2020. And more than that, the look back of this bill is for January 2019, which means uh, uh, roughly in less than two months from today. So once you're alive at uh, January 2020, you need to be compliant with the year look back. So, so this is really around the corner in terms of timeline for, the, for California. And this is by the, the third bullet, by the way, is according to the, to the conversations that the IAB are having with the regulators, we should expect at least four more states to follow with similar regulation. And, and just to understand the complexity, if now we're looking at the GDPR, if there's a German user in Germany that is using his phone and then traveling to New York, we still need to make sure that we are complying with the regulation of the GDPR, even though he is on US soil and it's got nothing to do with the GDPR, just because it's a German user. Now take it to the next level. How do you handle uh, uh, um, one regulation in California versus another regulation in a different state in the US? So the, the world of, uh, of privacy regulation is getting more and more complex. And if there's one message I think you should take from this conversation and call, is that we all should be aware of the of this roadmap of regulation. Uh, let's move to the to the next slide for a second. So the key factors in the in-app advertising uh, ecosystem for many years was about balancing between revenue and user experience. So obviously you can uh, come up with a full page ad upon opening the app that would be quite aggressive, but it's up to you from a publisher or developer perspective to decide whether you want to kind of optimize your uh, your in-app revenue stream and how do you balance between IAP and uh, regular in-app ads and how aggressive you want to be and obviously affecting your the stickiness and the, the churn level and other factors. And, and today, I think in 2018, for the first time, there is a new factor, uh, privacy, I would even say liability, So, which means basically the risk factor of, of presenting ads and we we all should take it into consideration while choosing the right partner and, and making the right steps in terms of providing data and, and signals. And uh, uh, let's move to the next slide. I'd like to, to move kind of to open conversation about the balance between, between the relevancy about utilizing data signals in order to have a real valid and good value proposition to the user versus his privacy. And, and in this uh, point, I'd like Yarko to kind of get your perspective of how do you see that at, uh, in, at Rovio? Yeah, and, and I, I, I totally, totally share, share your, your kind of re remarks on, on the importance of, of, of making, making sure that, that the, all, the, all the regulation is, is taken seriously because the regulation exists for, for reason reason and I, I i think that everyone all of us in the industry need to make sure that that we have an understanding on on the different kind of regulatory environments and and also take the privacy seriously on on every everything everything we, we do but i, I also want to then kind of point out that data also can be used not only to target advertising but also to improve the user experience in the in the applications and for example in on the gaming side to, to kind of decide that hey in, in which parts of the game and which moments are are good ones want to actually show ads to, to the users and and for example that has led to for us and the, the gaming industry to develop for example the rewarded video format that is 100% opt in format for the for the end user where where the total control is on the end user to choose that hey when i actually want to watch an ad and, and they know that there's a value proposition for consuming advertising within within the app so 
all the data can also be used to improve the user experience in 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 and, and that that is very very important also then ultimately for the advertiser because if if there can be a positive context on the on the publisher side that that also then relates to more positive the kind of uh, kind of environment to consume also also advertising in in mobile and, and for yeah. the develop so go ahead yeah go ahead. yeah go ahead no no for the developers that are on the call what would you recommend them to do in terms of handling those kind of uh, current regulation and upcoming regulation what would be the right steps and how do you handle it in terms of the perspective of the developer well i think like i said it's important for for all the developers to make sure that that they they know what the what the regulation is and what what it means and, and also what is, what is the spirit of 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 the regulation regulation and 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 then really do they they homework work and i think that's a good rule of thumb that you you, you at least it, it's a good starting point if you can explain your 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 practices and data collection methods and your privacy policies to yourself in 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 reflection to the regulation because if you can't do that then then it's probably even even harder to justify those those policies to any anyone else i totally agree let's let's move to the kind of the wrap up the last slide from our side with the with the key messages around the privacy so uh, when Yarko and I kind of prepared to this conversation, we talked about mainly three things we need to keep in mind. First of all, the, uh, even though there is a kind of uh, regulators within the industry, which are uh, uh, Apple and Google, we still all need to take kind of responsibility, uh, especially from the, I would say, from the advertising platforms and, and the ad network players moving to uh, to the developers and publishers and to some extent even the advertiser should be aware of of the of the regulation and take a, a full responsibility second of all i would say we need to align ourselves with the pl platform's policies and i'm sure that you know looking at the, what the google and, and apple and others are doing i know that they're uh, actively looking at different sdks and different solutions out there reviewing them and making sure that any at least any part of their ecosystem is aligned with the policies so we need to make sure that we are aligned with the with the internal regulators uh, uh, to some extent uh, and last i think and this is the most important and yarko talked about it uh, during his uh, brief conversation we need to make sure that we are tuned and that we are all uh, alerted to what's going on in the industry again I've, I've just mentioned a few of the things that are upcoming i'm sure we're going to have more news around this topic so we should definitely uh, uh, stay tuned Yako, anything uh, you want to add before we are moving to the q a session well i think that like just to sum summarize that it, it's of course it's shared responsibility within within the industry that that we we all all need to be responsible and and live live by 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 the rules not only by set by the by the regulation, but also by by, by the rules, we we as an industry said said to our ourselves, and and also that 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 we we are taking taking steps to make sure that everyone is is compliant. Thank you. Uh, I think we're good at this point to move to the to the general Q and A session. Great. Well, thank you so much, Amri and Yarko. Um, that gave a, a good understanding of the space of privacy. And so now to everybody, we're moving on to Q&A. So please, we are still accepting questions, so please send them through to the moderator chat, um, and you can direct them to who, whichever presenter you would like. Uh, but now I'm gonna start with some of the questions. The first question is a bit more broad, um, and it's directed at anybody. So uh, whoever has a response, you're welcome to, to chime in. The question is, um, how do I convince my team that in-app advertising is worth the investment? And Jeremy, I know with IBM, Watson, you've, uh, the past few years, you've been transitioning and making a large investment. Do you have um, an opinion on this? Yeah, sure. Thank, thanks for uh, passing that. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, it goes back to, you know, the very first slide, at least in my presentation, which is this is where the audience is and this is where people are spending the time. 
so if you're in this industry, whether you're on the buy side or the sell side, um, you're ultimately in the business of trying to capture people's attention. Um, and, you know, the best way to do that is to work on platforms where you have a large scale of people uh, who are highly engaged and spending a lot of time. So mobile and mobile app in particular fits the bill perfectly. In fact, I don't think there's, uh, I'm speaking a little bit uninformed at the moment, but I, to me, it's clearly the fastest growing uh, place where you, where you could do that as an advertiser, as a marketer. Now, I think the challenges still remain about uh, some of the topics we talked about, whether it's native or, or data or innovation, how to actually execute in the space um, can be a challenge, and there are certainly success stories and, and also challenges. Um, but the argument of whether to, to make the investment, I think, uh, to me at least, it's very clear. You have to go where the audience and the engagement is, and the answer is clearly uh, mobile app. I would add here one more comment about the fact that it's all about the data today. So from a from a developer or a publisher perspective, you can come up with a solid business case about whether or not it's worth to invest the time and the resources in making it happen. I, I'm quite sure, you know, based on a, a few years of experience within the mobile domain, you can come up with the right benchmarks in order to justify almost any level of investment because the best practices and the data is, is out there. You just need to, to take it, look at it, and, and see if it makes sense to, to your business. Great. And then uh, we have a question that came in from Sasha, uh, just saying they've had some issues even getting basic data for our advertisers, like where country impressions are serving. Is this an, an issue generally? Can this be adjusted through the Open Measure and SDK integration? I know, Mike, you are working with the Open Measurement SDK integration. Do you have um, any opinion on this? Um, so typically, for, like getting data on where your impressions is, are serving that, you know, will come from your buy side platform, your DSP that you're working with. Um, open Measurement's not really specifically set out to address that problem because it's really around providing a facility for viewability um, providers to be able to have a standard way to compile their data. Great. Great. Now, our next question is directed at Omri and Yarko. And this question um, is about uh, what obligations do publications have when users in Europe and California travel? Can you repeat that again? I'm not sure I, I got a question. Sure. So the question is, what obligations do publications have when users in Europe and California travel? Uh, basically, yeah. So it's a tough one. I'm not sure we have kind of the uh, we have the time to go over the in depth uh, uh, the scope of uh, of how do you handle this. Uh, I think Yako talked a little bit about it briefly. You need to make sure you're ready in the sense of uh, depends on on the nature of your mobile app to make sure that you're aligned with that. I'm not sure we can elaborate on how to do that. Yako, do you have any other perspective? Well, well, of course, um, I'm not a lawyer, so that a disclaimer that this is not not legal. <laughs> legal. Of course, in, just just to kind of in, in a, in a summarize, of course, in in such a scenario, GDPR is is you, you need to you need to apply GDPR to those those consumers. So, so you need to make sure that 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 you're compliant. Great. And now uh, we have another question. Just, it's a general question, so uh, whoever has an answer can respond. But it's, do you think that the challenges in in-app advertising are more organizational or technical? I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Um, if it's possible to do C, all of the above, uh, <laughs> I would choose that yeah. answer. Um, often the two go hand in hand, um, and, and, you know, I think that, that it is a new set of, uh, for, for either publishers or advertisers who are used to working in a desktop space, uh, it's definitely a different set of technical requirements and skills. Uh, so there's certainly a transition there. Uh, however, I would say at this point that uh, there's plenty of expertise on the market. Just listening to this call, you heard uh, 
you know, multiple folks that uh, really have deep understanding of how all this works. So it does exist, um, but it is a challenge. And I think that sort of leads me to the second point, which is uh, there's, it's likely um, with, if your organization is in the process of transitioning from uh, more of maybe a desktop-based focus to a mobile and app-based focus, um, it's possible that you, you need different folks or different organizations or different processes. Um, and that's certainly natural within, a, within an evolving business. Uh, we've you know, gone through periods where we've had mobile expertise teams within the company um, and then ultimately, you know, sort of everyone in the company became a mobile expert. So I really think it's a combination. It, it, it is different work technically when it comes to working with SDKs and some of the different data sets that exist in mobile. So it's absolutely a different skill set. Um, but the business is still the same. As I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier, which is uh, it's still about engagement and the attention of users. Um, you're just doing it on a different platform. So it will require definitely both technical skill changes and, and kind of organizational changes uh, to really be successful. Great, and Jeremy, that kind of uh, jumps into another question, which says, uh, what organizational uh, practices need to be in place? So I think you mentioned talking with a few, like working with a few other companies or vendors. Can you go into detail or, or if anybody else has, uh, has any input on this? Yeah, I'll, I'll make one quick comment and then pass it to others. Um, yeah, I, I would just say, you know, I think anytime you're getting into a new space, it's a good idea to set up a group that has expertise in that space. Um, so one of the mistakes that I've seen organizations make is say, oh, well, we'll go ahead and take this group who, you know, is really our smartest desktop folks and we'll go ahead and turn them into the mobile team. Um, I think you're better off going for expertise and, and truly getting people who understand it. Uh, and then allowing those people to be experts and kind of influence the organization and help it change. But that's just my opinion. Great. And we have, we have another question that just came in from Derek. And he says, um, if a developer is using mediation platform like MoPub, uh, what is the best way for them to run a fair unified auction based on bid price and not locked into a fixed price waterfall setup? I think, Mike, you might have a great answer for that. Yeah, so I think the best way to do this is that a lot of the header bidding um, technologies out there for in-app will work alongside MoPub. A lot the developers I've talked to, like this is where the bulk of their revenue is coming from this mediation today. So it's risky for them to kind of move away to new system all at once. So many of those vendor solutions will allow you to keep MoPub, um, run, run a header bidding, um, demand as well, and that will work alongside MoPub. And what I'm anticipating happening is that over time, demand will kind of shift, want to shift out of the waterfall into that header header bidding environment because it provides a better provides a better environment for all all the demand partners because they get to look at every impression. Whereas in the waterfall, um, you only get as a as a demand partner, you only get to look at a subset of the impressions. Great. And then in the event chat, we have a question that came up from Margaret, and she's asking, what is the recommended way to measure effectiveness of in-app advertising specific to brand lift measurement solutions? Uh, do any of you have, uh, have an answer to that? I would say this one is, is really a tricky one and we all look in kind of a different measurement tools out there, especially when it comes to brand, because you want to have an integrated uh, marketing strategy in place and you want to make sure that the impact of the of the money and the, re and the resources that you're spending on in-app advertising reflects the kind of the uplift in, in any other kind of digital funnel. It's fairly easy, so it doesn't matter if it's a it's an app discovery, app install campaign, or any other online campaign. It's, it's, it's a different case when it comes to brand. And there are tools, in, in, uh, advanced tools, in terms of, the, at least in terms of viewability. So you can know for sure what is the viewability rate. And you can say a lot about the demographics and the user that were exposed to, to your brand. How do you integrate it with your kind of the overall strategy offline as well? 
this is definitely a challenge that we're all looking at and, and supporting brand, brands in, in dealing with those. Great, and thank you. Uh, we're just about at time. Uh, so I want to thank you all for participating. Uh, Mike from Pudmatic, Jeremy from IBM Watson Advertising, Yarko from Rovio, and Omri from Startup. Uh, you've given great insight into the in-app space. I uh, just want to let everybody know that this webinar will be available on IAB's YouTube channel, IAB.com, and will be sent to you after the webinar. Uh, and lastly, I just want to say that next week, IAB is hosting a webinar to release the half-year 2018 IAB Internet Ad Revenue Report that's going to be on November 13th. So be among the first to become aware of the numbers that shape the industry. Um, I'm going to send the link to that in the follow-up email as well. So thank you again to our presenters, and thank you all for joining, and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.